Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel Online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that it will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. The older I get, the more I appreciate belonging to a caring family. I've got five siblings, and it seems like we're all getting to that certain age where various body parts are prone to wear out or break down. And so we find ourselves these days uh, texting back and forth a lot, kind of sharing what's going on in our lives and, and uh, praying for each other. Um, and that's a very comforting thing. It's uh, exactly what you expect of Nick and Audrey Ritter's kids. They taught us to believe in the power of prayer. And so we pray for each other. It's good to know that you belong to a family that will care for you and pray for you that way. Um, my wife has three siblings, and it was a blessing to watch them as uh, Mom Adelman was doing, going through a bout of COVID a month ago, to watch them texting and calling back and forth and collaborating to make sure that Mom was getting the best of care. It's a blessing to her to know that she belongs to a caring family who's looking out for her that way. Uh, we have uh, three kids, and uh, we're blessed by them and their spouses, our eight, soon to be nine grandkids, and we frequently share what's going on in our lives, and we pray for each other, like uh, last month when I was going through a bout of kidney stones, and uh, they all heard about it and prayed for me. It was good to know that they were standing with me that way. Or a week or so ago, when one of our daughters was going through a tough time at work, she let us all know what was going on so that we could, we could pray for her. Or then there was a time a couple of weeks ago, we got a text from the emergency room where Josh and Ann, my son and his wife, had taken their two-year-old son, Leo, to have a Lego extracted from his nose. <laughs> and there he is proudly holding up the specimen cup with the Lego in there, you know. But they text us right away, say, pray for us. Leo's in the hospital with us. I've got to get a Lego out of his nose. He stuffed it way up there. And we reminded his dad that uh, Leo's a chip off the old block because Josh had done something like that when he was about that same age. It's like a popcorn kernel way up there where it was hard to get out. Must run in the family. Well, then a week later, we got another text from the same son uh, saying, uh, pray for Leo. We're back in the ER again. This time he had jumped off the couch and had a uh, broken uh, hairline fracture of his fibula. And so it, it um, gets me to thinking that we're going to be doing a lot of praying for Leo in years to come. <laughs> That's a good thing he's so stinking cute. But Leo's soon to learn what a blessing it is to belong to a, a caring, praying family like that. And some of you are saying, well, how nice for you, Dave, that you've got such a caring family all around. Uh, I don't have that. You know, my family is one hot, dysfunctional mess. It's every man for himself, get out of my way or I'll run you down. If I were to say to my family members that I needed them to pray for me, they'd stare at me like I'd lost my mind or maybe even laugh at me. Well, you may not have the blessing of knowing that you belong to a caring family of your own flesh and blood. But the good news today is that we all can belong to a truly great family. In fact, it's the greatest, most caring family of all. So today I want to tell you a story about belonging to a family, a story that holds promise of belonging for each and every one of us, a kind of belonging even more significant and fulfilling than the most caring of flesh and blood families will ever know. We're in Mark chapter 3, verse 7, picking up right where we left off last week. 
where Jesus is just coming off a series of controversies with the Pharisees, the scribes, teachers of the law, and they have all made up their minds to collaborate, to work together with Herod Antipas to uh, keep the status quo in place, which meant ultimately finding a way to have Jesus put to death because he was a threat to the status quo. But Mark wants us to see that the opposition of Israel's political and religious leadership didn't keep Jesus from carrying out his ministry to the people of Jerusalem. And as he goes about that ministry in today's passage, people are going to fall into one of two groups. There are those who follow and there are those who find fault. There are those who follow and those who find fault, and it's a contrast of these two groups that will help us discover the secret of, of belonging to the greatest family of all. Let's, belong, uh, let's begin where Mark begins in chapter 3, verse 7, with, with those who follow. There are those who follow, and, and he talks about them beginning in verse 7, where it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, that's the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. And when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. So Mark wants us to see here that in spite of the opposition that Jesus has run into from political and religious authorities, it has done nothing to dampen Jesus' popularity with the people. They're coming from all over to see him. Much as they went to, to see John the Baptist when he was baptizing people in the Jordan, and they flocked from everywhere to go hear John preach and to be baptized by him in the Jordan, now with John off the scene, they're coming to the Sea of Galilee to see Jesus and to be healed by him. In fact, his popularity is such that it's no longer just people from the immediate neighborhood of Galilee who are coming to see him. Now it's people from the hill country of Judea. It's people from the big city of Jerusalem. It's people from across the, the river uh, Jordan to the east. It's people coming down from the sea coast to the north and west. They're coming from every direction. But these crowds aren't the followers I most especially want us to focus on because the crowds are going to prove very fickle and they're going to fall away soon enough. The followers I want us to keep our eyes on are the ones that Mark mentions next in verse 9 where it says, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now this is the third time already in Mark's gospel where Jesus has cast out demons and told them to be quiet. He doesn't want the endorsement of these foul spirits. He doesn't want them uh, broadcasting who he is before he's, he's ready uh, they, he doesn't want them forcing a confrontation with the authorities over claims of him to be the son of God. And so he tells them to be quiet. But what I really want us to focus on is back in verse 9 where it says, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd lest they crush him. Even this early on in his ministry, Jesus is enlisting the help of his disciples. Now, who were they? Well, as we've already talked about, disciples are learners, they're followers. They are students who would attach themselves to a rabbi, and they would listen to what the rabbi had to say, and they would follow the rabbi around. They would attach themselves to the rabbi and try to soak up everything they could from that rabbi. They would become that rabbi's disciple. And, and we want to, what I want you to see here is that while Jesus attracted crowds, he was investing himself in a handful of disciples. And we know some of them by name already, don't we? Back from chapter 1, we learned that uh, Jesus recruited Peter and Andrew, James and John, two sets of brothers who were fishermen, walked up to them as they were mending their fishing nets by the Sea of Galilee, and he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped everything to follow Jesus. They became his disciples. We know about another of the disciples uh, from chapter 2, where, where, as we saw last week, uh, Jesus approached Matthew at his tax collector's booth and said, follow me. And Matthew left his very lucrative business behind and followed Jesus on the spot. So we know at least five of the disciples by name already, and there are probably more. Uh, they've been following Jesus, and so he puts them to work because the crowds are crazy. 
And it's not like they're lining up in nice straight lines waiting politely for their turn to have Jesus lay his hands on them and heal them. No, they're kind of rushing him in a mob and they're all saying, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. And so Jesus is feeling kind of pressed upon here and he's saying, hey, look, if the crowds get to be too much, as I'm trying to teach them here along the, 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 the shores of the Sea of Galilee, you have a fishing boat ready, I'll hop in, we'll row off the shore a little ways and I can continue to teach the crowds from there. And so he's already putting them to work. They've already proven that they're ready to follow him and to serve. These are Jesus' true followers. They're they're attracted to him, not just for what Jesus can do for them. They're, They're dedicated to their teacher's welfare. They're ready to join him in his work. And they've proven willing to follow and to serve. So look what Jesus does next. He promotes them. In verse 13. It says, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he desired, and they came to him. Now, in Luke's gospel, it tells us that Jesus spent the whole night in prayer by himself on the mountain, seeking the Father's direction in in the, the 12 he chose. Mark's emphasis, rather, is on the fact that he chose from among those who had already proven faithful. He chose from among those who were already serving him and and working for him and looking out for his welfare. But what's clear here in verse 13 is that Jesus called and they came. No arguing, no bargaining, no complaining. Jesus called, they followed. And he appointed 12, it says in verse 14, whom he also named apostles. Now, apostle means those who were sent out and eventually they will be sent out. He called them apostles. There are 12 of them. Why? Well, because uh, any new community in Israel had to have a council of 12, reminiscent of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you're going to be a legitimate Jewish community, you needed 12 leaders in your council. And so Jesus chooses 12 because, after all, this is a new messianic community. They're going to be representing the Messiah to the, to the nation of Israel. There need to be 12 of them for this whole thing to be kosher. And so he, he chooses 12. So that, it says in the rest of verse 14, so that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. There's a three-part job description here for these apostles. You see that? First, they're to be with him. Well, that was necessary of anybody who was a true disciple. You had to be with your rabbi for a period of time. You followed him around. You, you ate meals with him. You learned not just by taking a few courses uh, from him, but by living with him. By, you learned not only by listening, but by observing. This was on-the-job training of the most intensive kind and included doing whatever the master asked you to do, which is part two of the job description. So they were to be with him and then they were to be sent out to preach by him. So as Jesus is preaching, he's giving them a script. They're learning from him how they should preach and what they should say, a message to proclaim. And then eventually we're going to see he sends them out two by two to take the message more places than Jesus himself could go. And so they help to multiply his ministry. And in the process, they're gaining valuable experience for that day when Jesus is going to tell them, now you take this message to the ends of the earth. So they're to be with him, they're to be sent out to preach, and to have authority to cast out demons. Because on numerous occasions already, we've seen that when Jesus preaches his message, people who are demonized would, encou- he would, would uh, stand up and say things and try to distract others from hearing what Jesus had to say. And Jesus anticipates the disciples are going to encounter the same thing. As they go out and preach the message that he gives them to preach, they're going to encounter demon-possessed people who will cause a ruckus and, and try to disrupt them giving their message. And so Jesus gives them authority to cast out demons too. The point is that these apostles weren't to be merely errand boys and flunkies. He's intending to equip them to do the same kind of work he himself does. He, he is training them indeed to be fishers of men. So given the importance of the mission and the responsibility that he's going to entrust to them, it's a bit of a mystery as to why he chose the men he did. Because if you look at the list that follows, this is a pretty motley crew. There isn't a lot here to commend these guys uh, to be world changers, right? 
He appointed the 12, it says in verse 16, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, two other fishermen that we learned about in chapter 1, and he gave them the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, which probably has to do with their thundery personalities. Wouldn't they be a, a chore to, to lead? So James, uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, who is Peter's brother, another fisherman, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, the tax collector, we already know about him, Thomas, who we'll come to learn is the doubter, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, so you've got a tax collector here who is pro-Roman and is regarded as a traitor. He's so tightly, tightly aligned with the Roman government and working for them. And then you've got a zealot who is very anti-Roman, would like to see Romans dead. This is kind of like having a Nancy Pelosi staffer and a proud boy on, on your team. You're, you're inviting people from opposite ends of the political spectrum to be part of your team. And what unites them? It's their allegiance to Jesus. They lay aside all of those differences to follow him. And, and then you've got, um, where do we leave off? Uh, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. What a crew. Four fishermen, a tax collector, a zealot, a doubter, a betrayer, and four guys we barely know anything about. Now Mark doesn't say why these 12 or what Jesus saw in them. Uh, only that he called they followed. They were faithful. Because apparently he doesn't call the qualified, but rather he qualifies those he calls. And they would give the next three years of their lives to following him. They would walk with him. They would eat meals with him. They would suffer hardship and derision with him. They would carry out assignments for him. They would experience the horror of watching him die on the cross. They would experience the joy of seeing him alive again from the dead. They would stand there in amazement and watch him be taken from them into heaven. And then, empowered by his spirit, they would eventually turn the world upside down for him. And all but Judas, who killed himself, and John, who died a martyr's death, or who died a natural death, all the other ten did die a martyr's death. They were executed for him. And so you can imagine how Jesus must have felt about them, these men who were agreeing here to so faithfully follow him. Now, we'll come back to them in a few moments, but for now we need to contrast them with those who find fault. Remember, there are those who follow, there are those who find fault. And we start learning about those who find fault in verse 20, where it says, then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. They're so pressed upon by these, these crowds are always bugging him that they can hardly get a decent meal in. And when his family heard it, uh, they went out to seize him for their saying, he is out of his mind. So first among those who find fault with Jesus are members of his own family. Anybody here relate to that? We, we learn later on in this passage that it was Jesus' mother and brothers who show up on this occasion. And apparently, you know, they're seeing this mob scene and how Jesus can barely get a, a decent meal. And they're afraid he's not taking care of himself and that he's giving so much of himself to his work that they've concluded he's out of his mind. He's lost it. And so they would like to seize him, it says here. Literally arrest him. That's what the word means. They'd like to take him into protective custody for his own good because he's lost it. He's, he's needing protection from himself and from the overbearing demands of the crowds. And if it's not bad enough that you have members of your own family saying that you've lost it, that you're out of your mind, we encounter next an official delegation of teachers of the law. These are experts in the scriptures who come down from Jerusalem and they find even greater fault with him. Look at verse 22, where it says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He casts out demons. How's that for finding fault? It's not bad enough that your own family's saying you're out of your mind. You've got important religious leaders saying you're possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. It's satanic power he uses to cast demons out of people. Now, the interesting thing is they didn't dispute the fact that he cast demons out of people. They didn't dispute the fact that he healed scores and scores of people who were sick. They couldn't deny that, but they're finding fault with 
the power that he apparently used to do it. He healed all these people. He cast demons out of people. But for all that, the religious establishment declares that he's not just possessed by demons. He's possessed by Satan himself. You know, people still find fault with Jesus today. I was scrolling through Facebook a week or so ago, and a video popped up that claimed to prove that Jesus was a liar. And then there's another one that, you know, claimed that Jesus never said that he was God. Others uh, say that he claimed to be God, but he was delusional like his relatives. He's out of his mind. Still others will say that most of what's recorded about Jesus are just myths made up by his followers after he died. Others will say he was a good man, but surely not God in human flesh. Some will say, yeah, he died on that cross, but he never rose from the dead. But what these experts in the Jewish law are claiming is the most diabolical suggestion of all. He's not just God incarnate, he's the devil incarnate. He's not healing and casting out demons by the power of God, but by the power of Satan himself. Now, you know, Jesus tolerated people saying a lot of unkind and untrue things about him, but he's not going to put up with this. So first he shows them how faulty their logic is in verse 23. He called to them and said to them in parables, he's going to tell them several short stories to kind of, you know, get them thinking. How can Satan cast out Satan? What kind of sense does that make? And here's the parable. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. Now, what Jesus is saying here is just common sense, right? A, a nation that's divided against itself into factions can't last. Abraham Lincoln quoted this passage in his famous House Divided speech in 1858 when he argued that if the United States remained divided between slave states and free states, we weren't going to last. If only we had ears to hear this in America today, right? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. But the same thing is true of a household, he says. A house divided against itself can't stand. Where family members are at war with one another, that family's not going to last very long. Think of a messy divorce, maybe, here. Where family members are at war with one another, that household will soon collapse. So Jesus is saying, think about what you're saying to me. That if I cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, don't you think Satan's smart enough to realize that a kingdom divided against itself can't stand? Don't you think Satan knows that if he empowers me to cast out demons who work for him, that that's like committing suicide for his cause? Verse 26, he says, and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. In other words, he's saying what you guys are saying here just doesn't make any sense. And to break it down in even plainer terms, Jesus goes on in verse 27 to tell another little parable. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Look, if you're going to rob a house and, and you've got a strong man who lives there and you're going to take away what belongs to him, you'd better be pretty sure that when you enter his house to take his things that you can bind him up first, Right? Only if you do that will you be able to take what's his. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm plundering Satan's house here. <laughs> I'm taking what belongs to him. I'm taking those who are in his possession away from him. And in order to do that, I would have to subdue Satan himself. And so I drive out demons, not because I have Satan's power, but because I have a power greater than Satan by which I can subdue him and take those who belong to him. Amen. I don't draw my power from him. Then Jesus issues this stern warning in verse 28. He says, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man. But whatever blasphemies, and, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Jesus is saying, the power that you see at work in me is not the power of Satan, but is the power of the Holy Spirit. And by saying that I do what I do by the power of Beelzebub, you are in effect calling the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. You'd better watch out, you teachers of the law who ought to know better. There's a lot of blasphemy that God will forgive, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven. 
you've committed the unforgivable sin, the eternal sin. You know, I've had some people come to me over the years and sit in my office, and I say, what, what's wrong? How can I help you? And they'll say, I think I've, for, I've committed the unforgivable sin. And I'll say, wow, that's pretty serious. <laughs> what you do? You know, and they'll, they'll maybe explain why they thought they committed the unforgivable sin. And I say, well, this really bothers you. You're really feeling conviction here about, about your sin, aren't you? In fact, you're, you're feeling so convicted about your sin, you're thinking this sin might be unforgivable. And they're saying, yeah, I'm really feeling convicted. I said, well, then you're, you haven't committed the unforgivable sin. Because if you're still feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're paying attention to what the Spirit's trying to tell you about your sin and how you need to repent of it, I can guarantee you, you haven't committed the unforgivable, unforgivable sin. Because the unforgivable sin is basically rejecting the testimony of the Holy Spirit about Jesus. Rejecting the, what the Holy Spirit has to say about your sin and your need of forgiveness and how you'll only find it in Him. The main job of the Holy Spirit is to bear witness to who Jesus is and to point you to Him. And so what it amounts to is to say that you've committed the unforgivable sin is to say that you have settled into a hardened unbelief where you're spurning what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you about Jesus. You're not listening anymore. And Jesus says, if you persist in that hardened unbelief, that yeah, then you can't be forgiven because you'll die in your unbelief. Now make no mistake, there is forgiveness available in Christ for even the worst of sinners, right? I mean, Jesus came into this world to represent sinful humanity. Although he had no sin of his own, he gave his life of infinite worth on the cross as our representative, the only price that was sufficient to pay for the sins of all mankind. It was the ransom that sets us free. And by faith in him, the risen Christ, we can have new life with God and forgiveness of our sin. That is available to all of us. The blood of Jesus can, can wash the foulest clean. But if you persist in finding fault with Jesus, looking for reasons not to believe, resisting the evidence of the Holy Spirit that points to him as the only one who can rescue you from the guilt and grip of sin, coming up with excuses why you won't commit your life to him, well, if that becomes the hardened disposition of your heart and you spurn the Holy Spirit's work, then yeah, you'll be guilty of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, whose most important work is to point people to Jesus. That's the eternal sin. That's the only sin Jesus says there is no forgiveness for. You know, there are some who make careers out of finding fault with Jesus, like the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. There are those who, like Jesus' family, find fault with Jesus' message, saying he's, he's out of his mind. They, they knew better than Jesus how he should conduct himself. And now the focus turns back to them, Jesus family member, his flesh and blood family, in verse 31, where it says, and his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called. So, you know, once again, it's one of these situations where Jesus is in the house, he's got all these people around him, there's no more room in the house, so Jesus' family standing outside saying, hey, can you get a message in there to Jesus? We'd like to talk to him. And what they're really planning to do is kidnap him. They're going to, you know, grab him and get him out of there. Take him into custody for his own good because he's lost it. And so it says that they called to him. Verse 32 says, and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, they, they passed the message in, your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. Don't you think you should go talk to them? And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and brothers Here's my family. Now, you may be thinking this is kind of harsh. <laughs> you know, a rejection of his actual brothers and even of his mother Mary. I mean, who, who rejects Virgin Mary? You know, that's... It seems at first really rude to disregard his natural family this way, and especially disrespectful of his mother, but I don't think we should see it that way. There's no question that Jesus loved his mother. Remember when he was on the cross, hanging on the cross? One of the several things that he was most concerned about as he hung there dying was the care of his mother. And he wanted to be sure that John would take care of her when he was gone. He loved his mother. There's no question about that. What Jesus is doing here, rather, is emphasizing a kinship that goes beyond natural family ties. 
as compared with the scribes who found fault with him, and even compared to members of his own family who thought he'd lost his mind, Jesus says that those who were present with him in the house there, the 12 he had chosen and the others who were there, shared a bond with him that went beyond the bond of flesh and blood and upbringing. Those who followed him, instead of finding fault with him, were his truest family. Can you imagine how awesome it must have been to be in the room and have Jesus say, here are my mother and brothers. But here's the best part of all. Jesus doesn't say that only those present on that occasion could be part of his family. He invites us all to belong, because look at how the passage ends. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Whoever. Jesus is saying the thing that identifies someone as belonging to me, belonging to my family, is obedience to the will of God. You know that you belong if doing what God wants is the driving passion of your life. Because that's how Jesus lived his life. He, he lived his whole life to please the Father, to do the Father's will. And those who belong to him are going to share in that family likeness, and they're going to want to do the same thing for their lives. This is the defining characteristic of those who belong to Jesus' family. The bottom line is those who belong to Jesus do the will of God. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that in order to belong to Jesus' family, you first got to do the will of God. You've got to earn your way into Jesus' family by doing God's will. That's not what I'm saying. Rather, we do the will of God because it's in the DNA of those who belong to Jesus. Because doing the Father's will begins with trusting Jesus to be our rescuer from sin and our leader for life. Jesus himself said that. You want to do the Father's will? Believe in me. Look at John 6, 40 for a minute, where it says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Earlier in John's gospel, it said much the same thing. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You want to belong to God's family? Put your faith and trust in Jesus. That's where it starts. Entrance into the family is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. And then when you put your faith and trust in him as your Savior and your Lord, then you follow him. You follow him as the 12 did. As his disciple, I learned to live my life as Jesus would live it if Jesus were to live my life. Because that's why he came. He came to give his life for me in order to give his life to me so that he might live his life through me as me. It's by the power of Christ in me, I begin to live my life in obedience to the will of God as he has revealed it to us in the Bible. I learn to love what God loves and to hate what God hates and to want for myself and for those around me what God wants. Whoever does that, whoever makes that the, the orientation of his life or her life is my, my brother, my sister, my mother. Jesus isn't denying the blessing of our earthly families, but he's pointing us to an even greater family to which we all can belong. Whether you come from a great family or a dysfunctional one, whether your family is always there for you or wants nothing to do with you, whether your family supports you or mocks you, Jesus is saying, whatever the condition of your natural family, you can belong to the greatest family there is, his family. Growing up in Muslim Iran, Shohela Kurtin shocked her family after they had emigrated to Canada, shocked her Muslim family by telling her that she had become a Christian which immediately put her on the outs with the rest of the family. And they didn't kick her out of the house, but they shunned her in the house. For instance, Muslims are not allowed to eat meals with infidels. So now that she was an infidel, she couldn't eat dinner with the family anymore. She had to wait until they were all done eating in the dining room, and then she would get leftovers in the kitchen. And that's how life went for her. In an interview with Magdalene John of 100 Huntley Street, a Canadian Christian TV program. She shares her story about leaving Islam and braving the rejection of her family, and then she's asked this question. 
And what was it about that Jesus? What is it about that Jesus that you decided that, yeah, I'd have to give up a family, I'd have to give up all of those things in order to follow him? You know, it's, he made me feel whole. Mm -hmm. He made me feel like I finally belonged. I belong to this family now. My whole life I was black sheep trying to find my place, mm -hmm. and he showed me my place. He showed me that I have a place with him, right in his heart, right on his lap to sit with him, to laugh with him, to cry with him, that he really is my best friend. Mm -hmm. You know, even in my darkest moments, I could sit and cry, and it's as if you and I are sitting here talking to each other. He's that tangible to me. And I can't, I can't turn that back for anything. I can't give it up. Did you hear that? He showed me that I belong, that I belong to a family now, that I'm no longer a black sheep. There's a place where I fit in. Jesus said, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the defining characteristic of those who belong to Jesus' family. The scribes found fault with him. His own brothers said he's lost his mind. But when Jesus called, the 12 followed. And so is it any wonder that he said, here are my brothers and sisters those who belong to Jesus do the will of God. Instead of finding fault, they follow. Amen. Will you?